Ah, time to visit the good old days of you green giant before Disney fucked you. We're smart, and my... He told me enough! No, I... Hey everyone, it's Donji Corleone, and happy 2023, everybody. So, y'all wondering, 2023 is going to be a pretty big year for this channel, because I'm doing several review series I have been meaning to do for ever since I started, but I was kind of waiting until I finally upgraded a lot of stuff, and now that I've fully upgraded, I have decided to finally do these series. So, starting to kick off 2023... Gonna finally start reviewing the Infinity Saga after roasting Phase 4 way too many times. I decided to review the good MC the good MCU era. And um, y'all remember I reviewed Iron Man in March 2021? Well, this review is not gonna be Iron Man because I already did that review in March 2021, and I'll post a review, a link to that review in the description below if you guys want to check out my review for Iron Man, if you haven't yet, and know my thoughts on the first one. But anyway, yeah. But this review series is going to be a little bit different. This month is going to be Phase 1, because February, I also kind of want to review the other Snyderverse DCU films I have not reviewed yet, because Shazam! Fury the Gods will be coming out in March. I want to get those reviewed before... The final DCU movie I'll be watching comes out in March, so yeah. And then March will be Phase 2, and then April, the first week of April, is going to be for some of the films in Phase 3, from Civil War to my epic rant for Captain Marvel. Because I'm saving Endgame for the four-year anniversary date of its release, because I'm going to, which is April 26th, because... That review is going to be on the day I call Endgame Day, because this is the year Endgame takes place, and um, I kind of want to, because, um, yeah, so, but yeah, and then um, Friday, I think, what is it, 21st, I might be doing an Endgame live stream commentary, if you guys want to join that, you're free to welcome, to join that, but in order to actually be able to hear the movie, you'll have to have a copy of Endgame to play when I say play when that happens. But yeah, anyway, what's this review going to be? Well, this is obviously going to be the next film that came after Iron Man and MCU. And that's going to be 2008's The Incredible Hulk, a.k.a. the most underrated DC, no, underrated MCU movie of all time. And this was back in the good old days of the Hulk, when the Hulk was actually treated seriously and actually a threat. Not the professor joke, the taco eating, the twerking cousin, not that crap Disney thinks is Hulk. This is the, the time when he was with Universal and when Universal actually treated him with respect. But anyway, let's, what's the plot of this? Well, depicting the events of the Gamma Bomb, the Incredible Hulk tells the story of Bruce Banner, who seeks a cure to his unique condition, which causes him to turn into a giant green monster under emotional stress. While on the run from the military, which seeks his capture, Banner comes close to a cure, but all is lost when a new creature emerges, the Abomination. So how was this made? Well, after the release of On Lee's Hulk, screenwriter Jim Shamus was planning a sequel which would continue the story featuring the Grey Hulk. He's also considering the leader in the Abomination as villains, Marvel wanted the abomination because he would be an actual threat to the Hulk, unlike General Ross. During the filming of Hulk, producer Harvey Art had a target May 2005 actual release date, then in January 2006, 
Hardcore for Marvel Studios to be providing the money for the Incredible Hulk's production budget with Universal distributing. Because Universal did not meet the deadline for filming a sequel, Marvel felt it would be better to deviate from An Lee's style to continue the franchise, arguing his film was like a parallel universe one-shot comic book. And her next film needed to be, in Kevin Feige's words, really starting the Marvel Hulk franchise. Producer Gail Ann Hurd also felt the film had to meet what everyone expects to see from having read the comics and seen the TV series. Transporter, director of The Transporter and Unleashed, Louis Leturier, enjoyed the TV series as a child and liked the first film. Had expressed interest in directing the Iron Man film adaptation, but John Favreau had taken that project, so Marvel offered him The Incredible Hulk. Leturier was reluctant as he was unsure if he could replicate Lee's style, but Marvel explained that that was not their intent. Leturier's primary inspiration was Jeff Loeb and Tim Sell's Hulk Grey, retelling the character's first appearance. He replicated every comic book panel that he pinned up during pre-production from the many comics he browsed. In the final film, Leturier said that he planned to show Bruce Banner's struggle with the monster within him. While Foggy added the film would explode, explore the element of wish fulfillment, of overcoming an injustice or, or a bully and taping into a strength that you didn't quite realize you had in yours. Had it himself. Arad also said the film would be a lot more of a love story between Bruce Banner and Betty Ross. And instead of following the 2003 film, it turned out to be the next film in the MCU, a month after Iron Man, and was released. The incre so after the film was marketed, filmed, and The Incredible Hulk would premiere at the Gibson Amphitheater in Universal City on June 8, 2008 in California, and would be released in theaters in the United States on June 13, 2008 as part of Phase 1 of the MCU. Now when it comes to critics, it got a more mixed reaction. It received praise for its action sequences and was an improvement over the 2003 film, but it was criticized for lacking in depth. At the box office, it was uh, not as successful as Iron Man and grossed only $264 million worldwide. And it was the least successful film in the MCU. And um, the production with Norton was chaotic. Edward Norton, who plays Bruce Banner in this, replacing Eric Bana, he disagreed with Marvel over the final edit of the film. Well, yeah, that's that's not shocking, really. And was replaced of the role of Banner by Mark Ruffalo for future MCU content starting with The Avengers in 2012. Which really, really sucks. Because his Hulk was perfect. Had, they, had Marvel not been such assholes to him, we probably would have had a great Hulk. No, but anyway, I'll get to that stuff later. As for my reaction, I feel like this film has gotten better over time. I did once find it a mediocre, but I've grown to like this movie way better than I used to. I mean, yeah, it's not among the best of the Infinity Saga, but I think it's the best MCU portrayal of the Hulk to me. And I wish Marvel didn't ruin Norton's vision because we would have had a phenomenal Hulk. Here, his Hulk was perfect. His Hulk was actually a threat. It was like... I have not seen the On Lee film, guys. I can't say anything about that Hulk. This is also the first MCU move film I saw in theaters. I, I missed Iron Man in theaters, guys. I, I didn't see Iron Man until it came out on DVD. And as many know, On Lee and Eric Banner tried to do a Hulk movie in 2003. It didn't work with some people. Some people I know do like it, but I haven't seen that movie, guys, so I can't talk about it. So this time, they went for a reboot, new direction, and cast and approach. And for other movies, the word reboot means an update from what we've seen before. The Incredible Hulk reboot simply means getting back in the basics, which would have been more action and brisk and easy to follow story. And like in other words, it aimed to be meat and potatoes, and that is what it is. The movie offers much of, of that is good and solid, but not spectacular. The plot is simply designed to make, to enable what we want to see. Nearly all the cast do fine, and I wouldn't mind... I would have loved to see them reprise their parts for any future movies. Well, William Hurt did reprise his role for Civil War. And I really love Edward Norton as Bruce Banner and the Hulk. I like him in a lot of things. I mean, I liked American History X. I liked him in Fight Club. Those I have seen from him. And I liked him in this. Here. Some people may, may not have been too keen on his Hulk. Mainly his approach for the character. But Bruce here is very, very slow and plus, and he literally thinks deeply about his predicament, and not too much in a battle of rage. So it doesn't really mean we see a lot of the Hulk in this movie, just kind of Bruce Banner. There's only really see Hulk of the action sequences, and 
And his chemistry with Live Tyler's Betty Ross is very perfect. Sadly, they don't have many scenes together. And the film side sidesteps the curse of the tedious origin story by showing it to the audience in the opening credits. That should really be a lot with more superhero movies more often. It works very well here. Like Bruce Banner works on a radioactive serum with love interest Betty Ross. He checks himself to see if it works. It transforms into the Hulk. And that didn't need to take 100 minutes of screen time, did it? And that means that director Louis Sotero has free reign to explore how Bruce Banner lives with the Hulk and attempts by the United States Army to track him down and neutralize him, which leads to several actions of pieces of only vehicles being thrown into the walls and soldiers firing a 90 anonymity of bullets at the Hulk, even when they can clearly see them bouncing off his body. And what is the best that you're hoping in a situation like that? If they keep firing, he might develop a vague sense of moral ill being and stop. And ultimately, the film boils down to a brawl in New York City between the Hulk and his evil counterpart, the Abomination, a special ops soldier. Like Tim, and Tim Roth plays him very well. He played a Bill Bronski very well here, and which was willingly injected with the Hulk genes. And much like the climax of Iron Man between between Obsidian, Obsidian, between Obsidian and Tony, a difference here is that the buildup to this fight doesn't seem rushed like with Iron Man because the interior has been able to utilize the whole of the film's running time to arrive at this natural conclusion, instead of being preoccupied with the origin story taken and antagonist at the end. And whoever thought about the casting of Edward Norton was much of a genius as the person asked Robert Downey Jr. to play Tony Stark in Iron Man. Norton plays this role with understandable finesse, never reading to overly paint facial expressions, and sense eye contact or shouting to display the anguish which is consuming him for the majority of the film. He simply shows that the Hulk size burden on his back to is destroying him, crushing his will to live. He looks haunted and tired, but possesses a steely resolve not to succumb to the beast within. Although it would temporarily end his struggle if he did so, he's so good that Christian Bell would have left, would have turned water to wine in the Dark Knight to retain his title as king of the superheroes. Like, there are many minor elements in Incredible Hulk that elevates it above most movies in this genre. Like, for example, for nearly half of the film, the odds are only provided with fleeting glimpses of the Hulk, much like Batman and, ba and Begins. His presence is not overused, though it easily could be with the Bavrilla Bav CGI show on the end. Indeed, the first case scene does not involve Banner turning to the Hulk at all. It's just an exciting pursuit across rooftops of Rio de Janeiro. And the orchestral score lends an air of intelligence to the film and enhances the scenes much more than an overdriven guitar track would have done. The inherent in imbalance in the scurb lends credibility to rumors of creative disputes between Edward Norton's influence and that of the studio. The opening sequences detailing Banner's fugitive life in Brazil proved breathless, tense, and tremendously gripping. Taking more than a few notes from the Born series upon returning to the United States, the promising start legs a little bit. His continual run with the military becomes increasingly repetitive and unoriginal, with the raucous fun of the periodic Hulk battles now sound with a flimsy romantic subplot, entirely failing to complement the intrigue. Here the script kind of begins to falter, tripping over itself during certain crucial Emotional moments with contrived lines and confusingly stilted character motivations, with the sideline of certain characters initially presented as major players, specifically like Ty Burrell's Doc Samson, who who is literally just only in like three scenes. By the film's obligatory big loud climax, it becomes clear that the creative re reigns have shifted. All the prior gritty realism has vanished, replaced with a more conventional, less enjoyable action finish. The occasional throwaway comic moments, like some more effective than others, prevent the film from descending in the realm of melodramatic self-importance. The film's primary redeeming factor emerges. Despite the steady descent into excess stupidity, it's never afraid to have some fun. Like the quality of Ivan Lee's incarnation kind of, well, from what I've heard, lacked from some critics. Of course, the primarily draw for superior blockbusters is seldom the screenwriting. And transport director Lucifer's unapologetic smash first talk later approach does generate some exhilarating action sequences, but the increasingly unimaginative fight choreogra choreography and relative splashery of action set pieces for an action focused film detracts from the glorious destruction that could have been. Attempting ju juxtaposition of emotional intensity only slowing the gleeful mayhem, and thankfully, after the. <sighs> Sorry, guys, like, I just kind of got up, so. Right. The, the other great qualities I have with this film are that this movie explores the character of Bruce Banner in an intriguing way with a great emotional story 
and Bruce and the Hulk is a great example of a character with a humble, likable personality that can easily be turned to an aggressive monster. Some neat acting, especially from Ed Norton, Live Tyler, Tim Roth, William Hurt, Ty Burrell, and Tank Blake Nelson. And the idea of Hulk being seen as a threat to an unlikely hero has great character development. The cinematography and lighting are amazing and fit very well for the Hulk character. Pretty good characters that have mostly aged well, and the somber, darker tone adds great tones for many scenes. It's exactly how the Hulk is supposed to be. A dark tone. It's supposed to have a dark tone. And I even really like that Tony makes a cameo appearance to really confirm that the Avenger initiative is really going to happen. Like when, when I first saw the movie, I had no idea that these two films were actually all part of a planned universe. So I was confused as to why Tony was in this film for a second. When this movie and Iron Man don't really feel related... And then I learned that these two films were actually a beginning setup to introducing all six of our original Avengers and setting up the 2012 film where they were all going to meet and that whole team was going to happen. However, the reason why it's not one of the best MCU films is because I have some bad qualities with the movie. And I can see why some people, it's not some people's favorite. The movie fast forwards through Bruce's origin story while the movie successfully pulls it off in the opening credits, it has to put in much more effort to make the characters interesting. And Emil Blonsky, he's not that great of a villain. Like, he's not really presented as a main villain. He doesn't really become one until the final half. In fact, technically, Ross is the true main villain in this. Most of Emil's personality is just military statistics of him being obsessed over capturing Bruce. And speaking of Ross I've just mentioned... The movie's other bad quality is, yeah, this movie introduces us to what is easily the worst, my most hated character of this whole saga, to this date. <sighs> like, guys, I despise Ross a lot. There is not a single film where he's even likable. One. He's basically the reason for all the Hulk's damage in the entire movie. He created the abomination. He doesn't even try to accept fall for it. And only called Bruce a fugitive to hide his own failure in the project. Like, and to not ruin his reputation. Like, even Betty Ross calls him out on that. Like, it was so satisfying when Betty Ross disowned him. Disowned him because he refused to understand that everything that happened to Bruce was all his fault. And even, even Ty Burrell's even character, even Ty Burrell's character even calls him out one part as well. Like, when he called Ross, he immediately regretted it as soon as he saw the Hulk actually save Betty. And he realized it and, and he literally is like to Ross, you know, I think now I know why she never talks about you. Yeah, because, because this guy, because this Ross guy is such a jackass. And hypocrites and stuff and and even in Civil War he learns nothing. Like next time he comes back he's still the prick he was in Hulk, except slightly worse. Like I'm surprised this guy's not in jail. And also some of the effects do look kinda of mediocre, like when we do see Hulk, you can kind of you can kinda of tell it's literally just Kind of just Ed Norton, just Jiner and Green, just through the Hulk's face. I mean, the, the the on Lee Hulk even looked more giant and looked a little better than this because the on Lee one's kind of how he looks in the comics. Here, I kind of wish they tried to make him a little bigger, but he looked fine. At least he was still a threat. So despite those bad qualities, The Incredible Hulk may not be great, but I still think it's the most underrated MCU film, and I do recommend it to Hulk fans that want to see the glory days of the character. Anyway, that's it for my view of The Incredible Hulk, and if you're wondering how I'm going to rank The Incredible Hulk, here's how I'm going to rank this movie. So overall, if you're a Hulk fan, then I do recommend watching this, but I would caution just streaming it to lower your expectations, and if you're wondering how I'm going to rank The Incredible Hulk, I'm going to give The Incredible Hulk 2008 a 7 out of 10. There we go. That wraps up my review for The Incredible Hulk. And now, 
And of course, obviously, the next review is going to be for the film that comes next. And that is, of course, the first sequel of the MCU, Iron Man 2. I'm going to film that review tonight and then pr let that premiere tomorrow. And then tomorrow night I'm going to rewatch Thor 2011 and make that review. So, yeah. 2023 is going to be pretty big for this channel. Can't wait to see how this goes. Anyway, guys, that'll be it for this review. Thank you all for watching. And if you like this and want to see more, and don't forget to like, subscribe to Don G. Corleone. Mm -hmm.